this. And I almost want to cry, but I'm just so tough. <clears throat> just so strong. Just so strong. Um, yeah, this is wild. Um, I appreciate all the love. You know, um, Pastor Dave made a joke about, like, you know, me not liking to be social. You know, it's a really, it's a real dilemma for me, actually. I think most introverts would probably say I'm an extrovert, but I feel like true extroverts would probably classify me as an introvert. It's the constant battle of my life, but I do love people. I do love people. I'm super thankful for all the love um, we've been given this morning. It means so much to me. Um, yeah, I woke up this morning and I was like, dang, this is like my last, uh, I was like, this is like my last Sabbath like here for a while. Like, it's wild to, wild to think about. I walked in the office the other day. I'm going to pick on Mr. Mikey Tomas a little bit. I walked in the office the other day, and Mrs. Slack, um, the secretary, um, really she runs the school, um, of, the, of the Thunderbird office, I walk in and she's kind of like, oh, hey, Zach, so good to see you. I need those keys in my heart. Oh, these are my keys. You can pry them from my body. <laughs> I was like, I was like, dang, I'm like, yeah, I guess you do need my keys. And uh, I remember, <laughs> I was like, well, can I hold on to them for just a little bit longer? And I had, uh, you know, slip some money under the desk for Mikey Tomas um, for him to under you No, he, he lovingly granted me permission to just sentimentally hold on to those keys for a little while. Um, but um, it's, been, it's, it's been a super awesome opportunity. You know, I'm, as we prepare to leave, it's just so crazy. It's just, I don't know, still hasn't hit me yet. It's like slowly hitting me. When I got the, this thing, I don't even know what this is, a shovel. I've never used a shovel in my life. Um, but I wouldn't even know how to use this. I'm going to have to go to university YouTube. Hopefully there's a class at seminary on how to shovel snow. Um, I'm just so used to this Arizona weather. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to wear that shirt every day. I'm never going to wash it. I'm just going to wear that Arizona shirt every day. Always represent proud Arizonian. Proud of our 120 degree weather. Um, and our sometimes rain that we get. Um, but I'm super thankful um, for the opportunity to speak one last time um, before we leave. Now, for those of you who have moved before, you probably know how frustrating moving could be. As a matter of fact, I just spoke to some, yeah, Sarah Lynn's like, yes, amen. Uh, I just spoke to some friends uh, recently who moved down here and, you know, they hired a moving company to move all their stuff and they had a difficult time getting all their stuff down here. And I think just the whole process of moving has got to be absolutely, absolutely crazy. And as I, as I begin, like, packing, as you pack, you know, you just discover all the random stuff you, like, don't need. Like, it just, you, you realize, like, how much stuff you accumulate over time that's completely unnecessary. Amen? Um, it's wild. It's, it's I, I, I found homework assignments for my first year of teaching here. I don't know why I held on to those assignments. They're just, they're just there. Um, so I spent a lot of time just rummaging through things that are completely unnecessary. But it's just wild. The more time you spend in a place, it's so easy to accumulate things. And not just like literal things, um, but you accumulate so many other things. So it makes me so thankful uh, that when Jesus comes again for the second time, we don't have to worry about packing. Amen? Uh, he said, I go to prepare a place for you, which means whatever he has prepared for you and me is just going to be so much better than anything we could bring along with us. I remember growing up, I'd go over to my grandma's house, and I remember uh, never really worrying about how to pack anything, because grandma had everything. She had the food. If I needed clothes, she'd go buy me clothes. She had the money. She just took care of me. Um, so I'm so thankful that when we, uh, when we make that transition into heaven, we don't have to worry about any of those things. Um, there's this book, a uh, compilation called Heaven. Um, it's a co compilation of um, Ellen White's, and in there she describes this experience of first stepping into heaven. She said, we try to call upon our greatest trials while we were there, but they look so small compared to everything that surrounded us. The far more exceeding and eternal weight of the glory that surrounded us, that when we try to recall our negative experiences while on earth, we had difficulty speaking about them. All we could cry out was, Alleluia, heaven is cheap enough. Meaning everything they experienced during the transition while here on earth to be able to get there, what she saw, she said, did not compare to what she experienced while there. 
I remember growing up, it was like going to Disneyland. Now, you know, the moment you step into Disneyland, like all your cares, uh, you know, sometimes seem to uh, seem to melt away when you're a kid because you don't have to worry about anything. And when she was there, she said it just kind of all melted away. Well, I was preparing um, for this message. I was packing at the same time because I can never work on one thing at a time. I always have to work on like multiple things at like all different times, just how my brain works. And so I was also backing up all the photos on my phone because I just discovered I have so many photos on my phone. Does anyone here want to guess how many pictures I have on my phone this morning? Take a guess. 7,000, 5,000, 3,500? Oh, 35,000, and about 11,000 photos. Now, some of you, Alex is like, what? what in the world? He has like two photos on his phone, right? <laughs> the Dodgers and like sports or something, I don't know. Um, yeah, 11,000 photos. I was like, how did I accumulate all these photos over time? And some of them are just like random photos of like absolutely nothing. And just somehow I took a screenshot. I don't know, they're just random photos all on my phone. Now, I know some of you, I'm not judging this morning, I know some of you, (laughs) Alicia, have twice as many photos on your phone. Good for you. Um, But I had 11,000 photos on my phone, and to me, that was a lot. I couldn't even, like, scroll through all the photos, like, to, like, look at it. It didn't even feel worth looking. And so out of all those photos that I accumulated just over time, probably completely unnecessary, maybe only half of them are worth keeping. Now, someone once said that a picture is worth a thousand words. So I did the math. Did a lot of math, punched in the numbers. If I have over 11,000 photos, that's over 11 million words worth of pictures on my phone. Now, you probably don't care about that, but that blew my mind. Like, that's a lot of photos. Um, So I did some more math, because I want to write a book one day. And so the average average book is between 90 to 100,000 words. And fun fact, you don't need to know this. This is a fun fact, though. Did you know that all the best sellers every year, the amount of words that are in those books gets less and less and less? Our attention span to read more is slowly shrinking. It shows in all my students. Um, <clears throat> it's showing. Uh, did you read that book? No, I didn't read that chapter. That chapter's two pages long. Um, I, I, I have so many other things going on. Um, so the average book is between 90 to 100,000 words. So if I could somehow like, it convert those words into a book, that would be over 110 books I could have published. I could be a published author this morning, but that's not happening because I'm too busy taking photos. The average text message is seven words a text. Seven words a text. Now, some of you, that may not be true. That's unfortunate. Um, But I I looked at some of my texts, uh, primarily the ones between Coach Alex and I, there are about three texts, three words of text, so pretty simple, straight to the point. You good? Yeah, okay. Food? Sonic? Question mark? Down. Um, super short words. Um, seven words of text. Eleven million words would come out to be, I had to spell this out because I can't read it. A hundred million, five hundred, seventy-one, four hundred, and twenty-eight texts. Why anyone would text that many times, I don't know, but that's just for your information to help you realize how easy it is to accumulate things that are just completely unnecessary. Completely unnecessary. Um, All those texts just take up random storage on my phone that are unnecessary. As a matter of fact, as we were packing, I'm kind of exposing myself right now. As we were packing, I just started thinking to myself, I was taking out all this trash, like, think of how much unnecessary space this is all taking up. There's so much room for activities in my house now. Like, I don't know, we could have a party. I don't know what we want to do. Um, but it's wild. And I think I, I hosted Lee Venon at Peoria Some Cities one time, and Lee Venon said this, we buy stuff, and then we have to buy more stuff just to take care of our other stuff, and so eventually we're left with just a bunch of stuff. I went to this event um, two, no, my timing's off, like maybe four or five years ago. Um, for sure my first year here, so a while ago. Um, and it's called uh, Catalyst West. It's a Christian leadership conference, and when uh, Pastor Ben was here, he took a group of us out there, and it's a Christian leadership conference for Christian leaders, and they bring in all sorts of speakers from all over the world. Like, they got the CFO of uh, Apple there to speak about finances and leadership, and 
They had this one person who I w really liked because I just think the idea is genius. Um, she was one of the co-founders of Goodwill. And she's one of the leader CEOs of Goodwill. And she gets up and she starts speaking about how her business will never run out of business because people always accumulate things. And I'm like, what a genius business model. You take people's waste, you sell it, and you make money off of it. Why didn't I think about that? Same to whoever invented the paperclip. I really wish I would have done that. But it's such a genius business model. And she says, you, you, you would think that sometimes in America we think that people don't like to give, but it's actually quite the opposite. We accumulate so much stuff that we feel better to give it away instead of throw it away. There's just a better feeling with, um, that goes with donating it. And so she said, specifically, she has a friend who has so much stuff. She says she has a friend who has furniture for every season of their home, meaning every season they're switching out all the furniture in their house. They have seasonal furniture, and she loves to give that furniture away so she can buy more furniture for that season. I'm waiting to have that kind of money in my life. I want that, but it's just so wild how there's never enough. We can always have more, and it's so easy to accumulate things over the process of time. Now, Regarding possessions, I don't think, I don't feel from my study of scripture, there's nothing with necessary, there's nothing wrong with necessarily having them, but Jesus does, he is pretty adamant about us not growing unnecessarily attached to them. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But he says, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love that idea because if you're making an investment, you can make an investment with the bank of heaven. God's always going to take care of your resources. He's no, he, he knows best how to invest it and how to use it. So that way when you get there, you can enjoy all of it. There's nothing with, wrong with enjoying things here, but it's so easy to accumulate and to form unnecessary attachments while here that don't prepare us for the journey of where we're going. So this morning, I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 19. You can follow me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 19. And I'm just talking about transitioning well. It's an idea that's been on my heart recently as I get ready to leave from here. And it's just one of those things that's like, you know, really, really hard. I'm we're talking to the new chaplain, um, Alexi, and I'm trying to create a document for her to share with her all the, all the things that I possibly can before I leave. And I'm I don't know, it's just something that was settling on in the heart, this importance of transitioning well, not only in our careers, not only in our lives or our families, but also spiritually and our journey into eternity. So Genesis chapter 19. Now, if you know the story, this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, you know, the, the wickedness of Sodom had become so great. I'm going to skip over those things. The wickedness of Sodom had become so great that God sent two messengers to reach out to Lot and his family to save them from the destruction that was coming to the city. So looking at verse 14, um, the Bible says that after hearing this, Lot went out and said to his sons-in-laws who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, he said, for the Lord is about to destroy this city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be joking. Now, it's really interesting, as Alicia and I are looking into like different like moving companies and we we're looking into different like people to help us unpack when we get to Michigan to help us with the process of unloading. I don't know why, but there's a lot of like Christian moving companies. Anybody ever notice that? Like we found a company called John 316. Like what's the point? But they're John 316 movers. Like this better be a quality move. Uh, there was like another group called like, I don't know, like God's Glory or something like that. And I was like, this better be a great moving company. Like, I don't know, maybe they have, I don't know why. But so many moving companies, just these Christian titles. And I think it's interesting that God, to make sure that he's reaching Lot and his family and the wickedness of the city, he sends two movers, these angels, if you will, movers, if you will, to reach out to them to kind of speed up the process of them moving because God knows that Lot has spent so much time there that he had accumulated so many things, had a future for his family, as we're about to see, that he would have difficulty transitioning. He knew it wasn't going to be easy. He knew it wasn't going to be easy. So when he told his future sons-in-laws, get up, we got to go, the Bible says it seemed to his sons-in-law that he was joking. 
Now, I don't blame them. Like, they had, they had their whole life planned out ahead of them. They were going to marry Lot's, you know, uh, daughters. They were going to be a part of the family. And if you know anything about Lot, he would have been wealthy. He was best. His cousin was Abraham. He took a piece of this land, and he, he, was, he was very well off. And for them, it didn't make sense to leave all those things behind in order to transition out of the city into the country. They had a hard time processing what was happening. And the disbelief, I believe, of the sons-in-law caused Lot to, I think, have a double take, to kind of reevaluate his situation and think to himself, man, should I really be doing what these angels are saying? And it's kind of crazy because when you follow God's plan for your life, sometimes if it's not, if it's big enough, it should cause you to do a bit of a double take. It should cause you to kind of step back and think about what was happening. And so he was hesitant, the Bible says. And this hesitancy keeps coming up over and over again. So looking at verses uh, 15 through 16, it says this. As the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Notice the sons-in-laws aren't coming. Lest they be swept away in the destruction of the city. But the Bible says, verse 16, that Lot did what? He lingered. He lingered, and I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. He lingered. He had difficulty transitioning, and he kept lingering. Well, maybe next time. Matt, should I really do this? Maybe we can delay it a little bit. I mean, if God sent messengers, maybe he can be patient. He obviously doesn't want to destroy me, so maybe he could wait a little bit. And what I think is so crazy, and preach a little bit this morning, that Lot and his family had become so accustomed to the wickedness of what was going on in that city that they had difficulty leaving. As if what had happened originally with the two angels and all the men of that city wasn't enough to get them to go, to get them to leave. They had become so accustomed to it, it was, a normal, it was normal for them that it didn't phase them and they still had difficulty leaving. You ever been in a situation before, either a relationship or just a situation in life where you knew you were like, I should maybe get out of this, but you kind of just keep staying. Ah, this probably isn't good for me, but you're like, but it's not bad for me. And you kind of just keep lingering. The Bible says Lot was struggling. This is where his family had been. And the thought of leaving was so severe, it outweighed all the wickedness that they were experiencing. The Bible says they lingered. Now, growing up, um, anytime my little brother got in trouble, I'm taking my little brother this morning. I have a little brother named Ethan. He's a taller brother, but he's still my little brother. Um, so he's taller than me, but Ethan, anytime he got in trouble, man, this guy would throw a fit. It would be crazy. My dad would be like, Ethan, go to your room. Now, funny story. has nothing to do with what I'm talking about this morning, but it's funny. My brother, growing up, he swore he was a vegan, like at the age of like, like in the third and fourth grade, he swore he was a vegan. And the reason why he swore he was a vegan is because he did not like my mom's cooking. Now, I love my mom's cooking. My, no, my mom's from like, my stepmom, she's from Sinaloa, Mexico, and she cooked bomb Mexican food. So every night, yeah, I see a head nod, amen. Every night, I was feasting. I was enjoying what I was eating, but my brother was just so picky, and I was like, you ungrateful little kid. And so my dad had had it one evening, and he's like, you know what, Ethan? If you... And then Ethan was like, I'm tired of peanut butter and jellies. I was like, I thought you were vegan. Um, Ethan didn't want that. And so I remember it was just a big fiasco. And my dad goes, Ethan, go to your room. And this is what Ethan would do. Ethan would linger. He'd do one of these. He'd be like, all right, I'm going to my room. Ethan, go to your room. He do this. He's like, either I'm gonna punch you, go to your room. He just do this. He would linger. He didn't want to go up to his room. He didn't want to leave his family and what was happening. So sometimes we just like get so annoyed, we pick him up and take him to his room for him. We do the service for him. And the Bible says that Lot was doing the same thing. He kept lingering. Verse 16. So the men, the angels, had to seize him and his wife, the two daughters, by the hand the Lord being merciful to them, and bring them out and set them outside of the city. Meaning, 
Lot had such a difficult just time leaving that God had to just, I don't know how to make this any more clear, buddy. I'm going to hold your hand, Lot, and you're going to follow me, okay? Has to pull him and his family outside the city. If it wasn't for God and his mercy to do this thing, maybe Lot wouldn't have been there for the rest of the story. He has to do that for Lot and his family. One of the first things I want to share this morning is sometimes in our lives, God removes us from situations that are not good for us without us even knowing it. Maybe in the moment we hate it, in the moment we don't see it, but oftentimes God in his mercy looks down on us, seeing what's best for us, removes us from a situation that wouldn't be good for us. And he had to do that for Lot and his family because he knew in order to transition him into the next thing, he had to move him, take him away from the city. When my family moved uh, from Vegas back to Arizona, I remember my dad, he was smart. He never told us we were moving. I came home one day, and there was a big for sale sign outside our house. And I remember I walked in, and I was like, Dad, what's that? And he's like, well, you know, you, you guess, you take a guess, yeah, we're leaving. And I remember that wrecked me because I remember thinking, like, the injustice. How could you, how could you, like, do this to us, just make this decision for our entire family to just, you know, up and move us. Why would you do that to us? Um, But looking back, had my dad not made that decision for us, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I wouldn't have attended Glenview Adventist Academy. I wouldn't have gone to Thunderbird Adventist Academy. I wouldn't have gone to to Camp Yavapines where I met Brennan Parfit and where God was able to reach me. None of those things would have happened to me had God not in his mercy moved me. Had God in his mercy not done that thing for me? So sometimes we have to be open to the idea of where God is leading, where he might be taking us, taking us because that might be the next step in our spiritual, in our spiritual journey. Jumping down to verse 17. The Bible says, after the angels had brought Lot and his family out of the city, one of the angels had warned them, saying this, escape for your life. Don't even look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills lest you be swept away by what was coming. He says, don't even look back, run away, run away. And the rest of the passage goes that Lot even had to negotiate with the angels. He says, I don't want to go into the country because I don't know, I don't have time. I haven't been prepared to live in there. Uh, You know, destruction might come upon me. The city's closer. Can I? And so what we see is God constantly being merciful with Lot as he's transitioning. Um, George Millar was talking about this morning in Sabbath school. Aren't we just so grateful that God is patient with us? God is so patient with us. He grows with us. He goes with us. Um, And so God is so patient in this instance with Lot and his family. He understands that they're having difficulty with moving, but God is trying to get their heart to, you know, come along with them in this experience. So he warned, he made, he, he, concedes in all these different areas. Yes, you can move to the city instead of the country. Man, you're lingering. I'm going to do the move for you. I'm just going to do it for you. I'm just going to help you. And he says, just, do, just don't look back. Just keep on going. Don't look back. Keep on going. Jumping down to verses 24 through 26. The Bible says, Then destruction came on Sodom. And God overthrew those cities, the valleys, the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew in the ground around them. But Lot's wife, behind him, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, I think we oftentimes highlight Lot's wife as being the one who didn't have enough faith to, like, move. Why did she look back? She didn't have enough faith to move forward. But really, I think the culprit in this story is Lot himself. Lot was the one who kept delaying. Lot was the one who kept negotiating. Lot was the one who was just a little bit presumptuous because he saw God's mercy. The book Patriarchs and Prophets says this, if Lot himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning, but had earnestly fled with his family, his wife and his would have made her escape. But his hesitancy and continued delay caused the family to lightly regard the divine warning. So while her body made the escape on the plane, her heart was still in the city. 
she had difficulty transitioning. When God begins to grow us spiritually, when he forgives us of our sins and all that we're doing, we can't keep looking back to those old things. Maybe we can be in another place, literally, but we have to make sure that we're also moving ourselves along emotionally and spiritually to make sure that we're not stuck in that place where we're used to be so God can kind of take us to where we need to be going. I remember when we moved back here from Vegas, when we had moved back here from Vegas, um, they say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, wasn't true. I remember um, I formed my own little gang in my public school, and you know we'd participate in va vandalism and other things and other activities. And after a while, I just kind of started thinking to myself, like, Zach, when is this going to get old? And I remember one scene specifically. I was at home. I saved up all this spray paint, and I kind of snuck out of my house. And I was going, and I was spray painting a wall. I was doing some graffiti. And I remember just in the process of doing it, I was like, man, why am I still trying to live the same way? Like, I've completely moved. I'm in a completely different city. I'm in a completely different state. But why do I keep trying to do the same old thing? There's got to be something new for me. And so oftentimes, after God saves us, it's so easy to get stuck in this old way of living. And we keep doing the same old thing. But we need to make sure mentally and emotionally we are also transitioning. Time and time again, we see in Scripture, God frees the Hebrew slaves, frees them from their captivity, but they constantly complain. But it was better for us where we used to be. And so God would have to lead them back into captivity just to remind them of the conditions he had rescued them from time and time again. Literally, Israel was in slavery, flees them from Egypt, and they're more, they want to go back to Egypt where things used to be. They saw God kind of conquer the Egyptian soldiers. They saw God kind of take out Pharaoh. And yet they want to keep going back to those same things. They were stuck in that other place. While they had moved on physically, they were still stuck in Egypt mentally and emotionally. They had difficulty transitioning from moving on to growing. When they finally made it outside of Canaan, they had a fear of moving into it. They had spent all the time focusing on where they used to be, that when the opportunity came for them to do a new thing, to grow into a new opportunity, they were too fearful because they hadn't even been preparing for that thing like Lot and his family. My last point this morning is we can't let the fear of what could be from stepping, prevent us from stepping into the life that God wants for us. We have to move boldly. Isaiah the prophet reminded of Israel of how far he had brought them and of the plans he still had for them when he said this. Thus says the Lord, I was the guy who made a way in the sea. I made a path in those waters. I was the one who brought forth the chariot and the horse, the army and its warriors. I was the one who covered them up and laid them down. They cannot rise ever again. They've been extinguished. They are no more. So he tells Israel, remember not the former things. No, consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. It's springing forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. In our spiritual journey, as we prepare for eternity, what does Paul say? Strength to strength, moment to moment, glory to glory. This one thing I do, I don't live as though I've attained it, but I keep pressing on to the upward prize in Christ Jesus. This one thing I do, I forget that which is behind, and I press forward to that which is ahead. God, thing, God always has things in store for us. It's just our responsibility to make sure that we are aware in the process of transitioning. I don't know if you're watching the Olympics, but my favorite, uh, some of my favorite things to watch in the Olympics are the parts where they're all running, where they're all sprinting. And I've never been a good sprinter. I can run long distances, but sprinting's kind of not my thing. And they say one of the things, regardless if you're sprinting, you're running long distances, they say the one thing you're never supposed to do is look back. 
because the moment you look back, it slows you down. And you're at risk for the other person passing you. Or like I saw a clip where a biker was kind of finishing his race early and he had thought he had it. He had hands up in the air and the guy that was in back of him, more hungry for it, was biking and passed him and overcame him. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 says, laying aside everything that sets us back, fixing our eyes on Jesus and running this race is before us. We need to keep Christ right in front of us as we keep on moving. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, this morning we want to accept your challenge, Father, of transitioning. It's so easy to accumulate through the process of time a way of comfortable living. It's so easy through the process of time to get used to a certain way of living that we get, uh, we, we become so conditioned to our surroundings that it becomes normal and we linger because we're fearful of the future but you've gone before us. You'll take care of us. Father, it is our responsibility to make sure that we are transitioning in every area of our life. So this morning, in whatever capacity, maybe you need to move us on from something. Maybe it's time for us to mature in a certain area. Lord, whatever it is, help us to be able to be aware of what you're doing and to transition effectively into what you want for us today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. We pray you guys are blessed and have a great Sabbath.